Welcome to Using K Nearest Neighbors in Python. I'm Kimberly with Real Python, and I'll be your instructor for this video course. I'm delighted to discuss K Nearest Neighbors with you because it's one of the most flexible and intuitive machine learning algorithms. In many data science problems, you'll present an algorithm with a data set of known features, like width and height. When a new observation arises, you'll want to use the information you currently have to make a prediction for it. K-Nearest Neighbors can help you make such a prediction, and it does so by examining the new data point's closest neighbors. It uses known information about those neighbors to help predict an outcome. But you don't need to visualize all your data to make K and N work. Instead, you can code up your own K-Nearest Neighbors algorithm using Python. Here's what you can expect from this course. After this brief overview, you'll learn what KNN is and what its main features are. We'll use one primary example throughout this course, so you'll get a sense for that data set about sea snails before diving into a clear explanation of how the K-nearest neighbors algorithm works. Next, you'll get a chance to code up your own KNN model, first from scratch, and then with the machine learning package Scikit-Learn. After that, we'll conclude by summarizing the course and reviewing the benefits and drawbacks of KNN. So let's get started with the distinguishing features of K-Nearest Neighbors. In this lesson, you'll learn about the distinguishing features of the K-Nearest Neighbors algorithm, or KNN. KNN is a supervised learning algorithm. In general, supervised learning algorithms learn from training data in order to make predictions. You'll start with a model and feed it data points that will have been labeled with the kinds of target values you're interested in predicting. The model will learn from these inputted observations, and this process is called training or fitting the model. Once that's finished, you'll have a trained model ready to go. Trained models can then go on to make predictions for new data points. Later, you may have some new data that do not have target labels. You can pass these values into your trained supervised learning model, and the output will be predicted targets. This phase is called predicting. KNN works just like this. You'll pass some training data with known target values into it, and then you'll be able to use that trained model to make predictions for new data observations that perhaps do not have target labels. There are two types of supervised learning problems classification, and regression, and KNN can be used for either type. In classification, you're trying to build a model that makes categorical predictions, such as whether an observation is a square, circle, or triangle. Or for a real-world example, you might train a classification model to predict whether or not a customer will click on your ad. Regression problems, on the other hand, make numerical predictions, or continuous values from a number line. Now your question might be, how much money will a customer spend next month? Since the predictions for this question are dollar amounts, rather than discrete categories, this is a regression problem. Machine learning models can be built to answer classification or regression questions, and luckily, KNN can be used to predict either. Machine learning algorithms can be linear or nonlinear. Linear models make predictions that follow lines or hyperplanes, whereas nonlinear models do not. For example, say you have classification data like these. Height and width are your input variables. You're trying to predict if the target is a triangle, cross, or star. If you build a linear model to make this prediction, you could end up with a line like this one, which divides the input space into triangles versus non-triangles. Your model predicts every point below the line to be a triangle and every point above the line to be a non-triangle. If you train a nonlinear model, however, you will likely end up with a more complicated classification boundaries. For example, you might create this decision tree model. It says if a point's height is low, this point is predicted to be a triangle. If the height is high and the width is low, it's a cross. Otherwise, the point is a star. KNN is a nonlinear algorithm 
For classification problems, that means it can make more complicated decision boundaries that don't necessarily follow lines or hyperplanes. For regression problems, its predictions don't need to follow linear or even monotonic relationships with respect to its inputs. And finally, some machine learning algorithms work by learning model parameters. For example, linear regression models are built by finding the best parameters to summarize the training data that they're exposed to. A simple linear regression model like y equals ax plus b has two model parameters, a and b, that are learned during the model fitting phase. These parameters are then reused when it comes time to make predictions from the trained model. KNN, on the other hand, is a non-parametric algorithm. That means it does not have model parameters that need to be fitted during training. Predictions are made directly from the training data itself. This non-parametric nature makes KNN a highly flexible algorithm since it doesn't attempt to force any model form onto the data. However, to be able to make predictions, a trained KNN model must retain the entire training set. That can be highly memory intensive for problems with a lot of training data. And it can also mean that KNN takes a long time to make predictions. In summary, KNN is a machine learning algorithm. It is considered a supervised algorithm because it learns from data with labeled target values. KNN can be used for either classification or regression problems. It's a nonlinear algorithm and it's also non-parametric. That makes KNN highly flexible. And as we'll see in upcoming videos, its logic is really intuitive and it's easy to explain. But on the downside, KNN tends to be memory intensive and inefficient for large amounts of data since it needs to keep the whole training set in order to make predictions. In the rest of this course, you'll learn how the KNN algorithm works and how to use it to make predictions, namely predicting the age of sea snails like this little guy. He doesn't look a day over 10 to me, but you'll learn all about his data set coming up next. Now it's time to learn about predicting the age of sea snails. The Abalone data set contains publicly available biological data with measurements of several thousand abalones. To follow along with the coding part of this course, you'll be using the Abalone dataset to build a K-nearest neighbors model. So what are abalones? Well, here's an example if you'd like to see one. Abalones are a family of sea snails that look a bit like mussels. They're found around the world, but mostly in cold waters. The abalones in this dataset were collected near Tasmania, Australia. Eventually, you'll be training a KNN model to predict abalone age. Biologists can calculate an abalone's age by counting the inner rings on its shell. However, this process involves cutting through the shell, staining it, and using a microscope to count the rings, which is a tedious process. Your goal is to create a model that takes in the abalone's physical measurements and estimates its age. If successful, such a model would help biologists, saving them time and effort. You will now begin analyzing the abalone dataset by importing it and checking a few of its descriptive statistics. If you haven't already done so, be sure to import Python with Anaconda so you can follow along with the code. The Anaconda distribution of Python comes with all sorts of useful libraries you can use to work with the data. Specifically, you can get the pandas library to get started in this lesson. First, import the pandas library and alias it as pd, which is standard. The abalone dataset is publicly available through this URL, so you can use pandas read csv function to download the data and structure it as a pandas data frame. Also note that these data do not have a header with column names, so set header to be none for now, so that the data are read in properly. You can now view the first few rows of the abalone dataset by executing abalone.head. Each row in this dataset represents an individual abalone, while each column is a different measurement. Right now, there are no column names 
but those can be found on the UCI Machine Learning Repository. Here's a list of those names, and you can go ahead and assign those to the columns property of the Abalone data frame. Since the goal of this exercise is to make age predictions based off of the physical measurements of the abalones, you should remove the sex column from the data set. You can use the drop method to do this. Just be sure to specify axis equals one to tell pandas you want to drop a specific column instead of a row. Take a look at the top part of the abalone data frame once again to verify that the columns have been named appropriately and that sex is no longer included. And you can also check abalone.info to see that there are just over 4,000 rows, or abalones, in this data set. You can also check if there are any missing values, which there are not. And you should also see that all of the columns are numeric, either floats or integers. Now that you have the data loaded in and have a general feel for what's included, let's learn more about the target that you're going to try to predict. In this case, that's the rings column. You can use the describe method to understand general summary statistics here. These abalone have 10 rings on average, and most seem to have between 8 and 11 rings. However, the minimum is 1, and the maximum is 29 rings in this data set. A histogram will also give you a good sense of the rings. You need a plotting library to do this, and one option is Seaborn. To use it, import Seaborn, and it's common to alias this library as SNS. Now you can call sns.histplot to create a histogram. You want to plot the rings column. And let's go ahead and specify 15 bins for this histogram. The decision to use 15 bins is made based on trial and error. If you specify too few bins, you may miss out on certain trends. However, if you set the bin number too high, your histogram won't look nice and smooth. This histogram of the abalone rings shows a nice peak right around 10 rings. And you can also see the great majority of abalones have between 5 and 15 rings, though there are some with fewer and more. Since you're going to be building a machine learning model to predict rings, it can also be helpful to explore correlations between your input variables and the target output. Here, you're hoping for variables that have strong correlation with the target, because that would mean the physical measurements and abalone age are related, and your modeling efforts have some chance of succeeding. To compute correlations, apply the dot core method to your data frame. This correlation matrix variable now contains correlations between every column of the abalone data frame and every other column. But perhaps the most important correlations are those for the output rings variable. Let's look specifically at the correlations between rings and every other variable. The closer to one, the more positive correlation there is. Of course, rings is perfectly correlated with itself at a value of one. Based on these values, you can conclude that there's at least some correlation between the physical abalone measurements and their age, but it's not particularly high. If you solve very high correlations, you could expect a fairly straightforward modeling process, perhaps using something like linear regression. In this case, you can try k-nearest neighbors and see what happens. There are, of course, many other ways that you could explore these data using pandas. Try a few others out as well and see what else you can find. In this lesson, you learned about the abalone data set, which is publicly available data about a type of sea snails. The eventual goal of this project will be to predict an abalone's age, or rings, from its physical measurements. So you'll be building a KNN model to do just that. You went on to explore the data set using pandas. Specifically, you plotted the distribution of the rings in this data set and noted that most abalone have about 10 rings. You also calculated the correlations between the physical measurements and the rings 
and saw that these quantities are at least somewhat related. In the next lesson, find out how KNN actually works through a step-by-step -step approach to this highly intuitive algorithm. By the end of this lesson, you'll be able to explain how the K-nearest neighbors algorithm works. Recall that KNN is a supervised learning algorithm that learns from training data with labeled target values. Unlike most other machine learning algorithms that learn during the training phase, KNN performs nearly all of its calculations during the prediction phase. KNN is a nonlinear algorithm capable of learning complex patterns, and it's also non-parametric, so it does not summarize the training data into a set of prescribed parameters. And you can use KNN for either classification or regression problems. The K-nearest neighbors algorithm boils down to one ultimate main idea. KNN assumes that data points are similar to their neighbors. When it comes time for a trained KNN model to make a prediction for a new data point, the model will first find that new point's nearest neighbors from the training data set. Then it makes predictions based on the targets of those neighbors. And that's pretty much all there is to make a prediction with KNN. Pretty simple, right? The intuition behind KNN really makes a lot of sense. Think about the neighbors where you live. You likely have a lot in common with them. You're likely in a similar socioeconomic class, and perhaps you do similar types of professional work, or maybe their children attend the same school as yours, and so on. But of course, this neighborhood approach doesn't always make sense. For example, you wouldn't compare yourself to your neighbors when trying to predict your favorite color. And the same goes for using KNN. For some problems, this method will be highly successful but for others, it will not. So predicting with k-nearest neighbors involves two primary steps, finding the data point of interest's nearest neighbors, and then making a prediction based on those neighbors' targets. Let's talk a little bit more about that first step. You may have a few questions about this part of the algorithm, namely, how should nearest be defined? And how many neighbors should be considered? There are a few different ways that nearest can be defined, but typically you will use Euclidean distance to judge how close data points are to one another. Say that you have a problem with two variables, height and width, and you want to know how close two data points, A and B, are to each other. These data points actually represent vectors in two-dimensional space. Vector A spans from the origin to point A, while vector B goes from the origin to point B. If you want to measure the distance between A and B, you can follow vector A to its end point and then draw vector negative B, which is the same length as vector B, but it just points in the opposite direction. The point where this new vector ends is vector A minus B, and its length is actually equivalent to the distance between points A and B. So usually, nearness is determined as the length of the vector between points A and B. You can use the Euclidean distance formula to measure that length. The Euclidean distance between points A and B is defined as the square root of the quantity A1 minus B1 squared plus A2 minus B2 squared plus so on all the way down to AN minus BN squared where n represents the number of variables that your data has. This formula is equivalent to the norm of vector a minus vector b, since the norm measures the length of the vectors. And if all of this reminds you of the Pythagorean theorem, you're absolutely right. The Euclidean distance formula can be derived from the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, now you know how nearness is defined. What about the other question? How many neighbors should be considered by the algorithm? Well, the k in k-nearest neighbors represents the number of neighbors. At minimum, k will be equal to 1, 
which would mean that when a new data point needs a prediction, you will only look at its nearest neighbor from the training set to assign it a target. On the other end of the spectrum, at maximum, k could be equal to the total number of points in the training set. For that case, you would pool the targets of the entire training set any time a new data point needed a prediction. Neither option, neither the minimum nor the maximum k, is typically used in practice. Instead, you will need to optimize k to suit your individual problem. k is a so-called hyperparameter of the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, which can be set using validation, cross-validation, or with some other strategy. Returning to the main steps of k and n, you know about finding the neighbors in step one. So what about step two? How can you make predictions from those neighbors' targets? It turns out that this depends on your type of supervised learning problem. For classification problems, you will use majority vote. KNN predicts based on the mode, or the most popular, class targets of the point's neighbors. Once again, say that you're considering two variables, height and width. You have a training set for these two features, like this one. When it comes time to make a prediction for a new data point with a new height and width, your KNN algorithm will look at the point's neighbors, and perhaps you want K to be equal to 5. KNN will find the five nearest training data points. Since these are training points, these have known target class labels. So maybe this one's a square, and this one's a circle. You have a square, a triangle, and another square. What should the prediction for the data point in question be? Well, each neighbor gets one vote, and since there are three votes for the square class, KNN predicts the new data point will be a square as well. You may be wondering what happens in the event of a tie. The default behavior for most KNN implementations is to break ties by prioritizing the vote of the closest neighbor. You will soon be considering the Abalone dataset once again, which is a regression problem. So how does KNN make predictions for regression? KNN predicts the average of the nearest neighbor's targets for regression problems. Given the same setup for height and width, if you want to make a regression prediction for a new data point based on five neighbors, once again find the five closest neighbors. But now the targets of those neighbors are numeric. Maybe this one has a value of 4.5 and this one is 2.1. You have 3.3, 4.2, and 2.9. KNN will take those five values, compute their average, and then predict an average value of 3.4 for the test point in question. To recap, KNN relies on the guiding principle that data points are similar to their neighbors. Training a KNN model basically just involves memorizing a training set of data points. But when it comes time to make a prediction, KNN follows two steps. First, find the nearest neighbors of the data point of interest. You will almost always use Euclidean distance to judge closeness, and you will also need to set k, the number of neighbors to consider. Once those neighbors have been found, make a prediction based on the targets of those neighbors. For classification, that means taking a majority vote of the neighbor's class targets, and for regression, that means averaging the neighbor's target values together. Up next, you'll start creating your own KNN model from scratch by writing Python code.